I have to say I'm overwhelmed. Um, this conference has been amazing to me. Uh, all, the, all of you who've come and how brilliant you all are. Um, I've had some tremendous conversations about all kinds of complex things that uh, the, the, the IQ here is phenomenal. It's, and, and the knowledge of the, and the experience has been, is amazing. And I want to thank you. Um, you know, your, your mental space is limited. Like what you can think about it and what you have time to think about and where you have time to focus is, is actually pretty limited in the world. You can't focus on everything. You can't learn everything. But that you choose to learn Lookamel and, le and learn Looker, it just humbles me. I, uh, and I want to thank you again for making that investment. Um, we're, um, anyway, thanks. Um, uh, today, today, today I'm going to talk to you about databases. Um, that, that, that there, there's a, a joke, there's uh, two kinds of people in the world. Um, those who think there are two kinds of people and those who don't. <laughs> okay. Well, there are two types of databases. In the <laughs> uh, there's two types of databases in the world. There's transactional databases and analytical databases. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about both of these. I'm going to mostly talk about analytical databases. Um, but um, the transactional databases are databases that your applications are built in, towards. So things like um, MySQL or Postgres or Google, um, uh, Google Spanner or Aurora. Or, and, and, and they're where you write data. And they're focused on actually making sure that you can keep the write rates up high and that, that, that the data is up to date and that the latency, that, that you can actually get out the data really fast, right? That, those, that's what the focus of the, the, the design point for the transactional database. And the design point for an analytical database is so that you can actually scan really big amounts of data and relate it, right? Get, getting large data and, and, and relate it. And um, who, who has Looker hooked up to a transactional database? Come on, there's, I know there's more. <laughs> uh, who has Looker hooked up to an analytical database? OK. Who has Looker hooked up to both of these databases? OK, great. All right. So, um, uh, there, there are different things that you would do with different databases, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why you would use one or the other and what the future looks like. So, um, so uh, 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 in the past, um, let's see, there are three struggles basically with um, analytical databases. Um, and these struggles um, keep us from getting more and more value out of, out of the database, right? So. Um, You've got this big analytical database, you pump data into it, and, and there, are, there are certain things that it's good for and certain things that it's hard to do with today. And I'm going to talk about things that, that are going to change in the future about that. And the first struggle is moving your data. So last year at AWS reInvent, uh, they drove a 44-foot semi up on the stage. Big, bigger stage than this. But they, they, had a, they had a big stage, and they put a, a semi on it, and they had something called the snowmobile. Does anybody, is anybody aware of this, the snowmobile? OK, so the snowmobile was a semi truck with a, with a trailer that was full of hard drives, like literally full of hard drives. And you would back up this, this semi to a data center, and you would pump your data into the, data, into this, into the semi. Right, this, is, this is a real product. This is really what you do. You, from the enter, your enterprise, you pump your data into the semi, and then you drive it to the cloud, and then pump it into the cloud. <laughs> OK, that's, that's, that's how it goes, right? So why, why would you pump your data? Why wouldn't you just send it through the pipes, right? Because they had, a, they had a big chart that showed you how many years it would take to pump the amount of data through a pipe and how big the pipe was if you didn't use the semi to drive the data. So da moving data is hard. It's, it's a real problem, right? So you think about data not having weight, but it takes semis to move data. Um, latency is the other problem. Um, just this morning, uh, the uh, Cassini spacecraft uh, let, crashed into Saturn. Um, well, it was intentional, right? They, 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 it's been investigating Saturn for 20 years, and in and, and, and its last-ditch effort this morning at 6 a.m. Eastern time, uh, it took a dive into, uh, into Saturn. Um, and it recorded some stuff in the atmosphere. Um, but we didn't hear about it until 7.30. Because the latency between the time when it happened and the time that we got the signal was the speed of light, which is about 70 or 80 minutes or something like that. So it, it takes, latency is the time it takes between when the thing happened and when you can actually see it. And the problem with analytical databases is that you have latency. 
right? So um, when you move data, it takes time to move the data, and the, the movement, that movement means that there's, there's, um, there's a delay. And the kind of, you can't steer the Cassini spacecraft because if we said turn left, right, as it's making a dive, it's too late. By the time, it's already crashed by the time, um, by the, time the signal gets there. Um, the latency in, 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 in data, the latency would be uh, you move your data in and you've got your shipping data and you're, moving, you're uploading your data every, every day and you know that these shipments were late yesterday, but you can't act on them because the they, some of them may have already shipped, some of them may, or may still not be shipped, but you don't really know. So the latency limits what you can do with your analytical warehouse, right? Um, and the other problem is centralization. So you pump data from all different sources into the warehouse and then uh, the, the data that you own and you, you know really well, well, you know, you, you know the structures in the schema of your transactional data, but when you start putting other people's data in, it comes in in this complicated schema form and it's hard to understand. And this is what Looker is really good at. We can build blocks to help describe the data so that you can do it. So we solved this problem really well and we, we, we're working on making this problem even better and um, we'll talk about the ways we've made this better this year. But, but this is the other big problem with, the other big struggle with analytical warehouses. Um, so how does it work today? Um, we have, uh, so, so moving data is really hard. Um, who's ever seen a commercial where the um, guys are driving the cars on the, uh, on the road and they're, they're, they're flying down, the, down the na through neighborhoods and, and then at the very end of the commercial they say, uh, close track, don't, professional driver, don't try this, right? Um, uh, moving data is like that. You, you, when you first want to start centralizing all of your data, you, you are tempted to write a bunch of scripts to start moving the data into your warehouse. Um, except that uh, it's, it's pretty tough to do. It's a pretty tough job. And to get it right and get it working consistently is, is hard. So we have all of these great partners that, you, that, are, that are around outside who specialize in moving data and, and, getting, it, and getting it into your database. And they're working really hard to keep it as low latency, late, low latent as lowly latent as possible. And what they're using are generally a lot of APIs that uh, SaaS vendors provide or, 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 or figuring out which, which files that you want to move from your transactional database. Um, and the best practice is to uh, read from the API, figure out what's changed, and write that in. And then every once in a while, we'll resync a, a fresh copy. Um, and um, and it's, it's a hard problem. The APIs were not designed to do replication. This is a form of data replication. And, um, and what they specialize in is being able to build replicators out of APIs. Um, and so that's the, that's the state of the art of today. That's what we're seeing a lot of today. Um, um, so, so I'm here, why would I tell you all of this? Because if I, if I didn't think something different was going to happen. And so what's next? Where are we going with all of this? Um, um, the, the future is kind of magic. Um, in the future, your data just appears, and it's on time and it's in your analytical database. And when it's there, um, and, and, and also because Looker has built all these blocks and stuff for you, you can relate it all in a very easy way, right? That's, that's the future that we see. That's, that's what the future we're building to. Um, well, you should be able to take action out of your analytical database, um, um, uh, it, and data will be on time, and we will, we, we'll be able to relate all of, this, all of this interesting data together. Um, let's, um, let's talk about how that's happening. So. Um, uh, Amazon, uh, trucks, when, that, when, the, when, the, when that truck arrived in Amazon, it arrived at a place called S3. Um, S3 is Google's, uh, sorry, Amazon's giant disk drive in the sky that you don't have to manage. It's always backed up and it's always, it's always available. And um, recently, Amazon has made uh, Redshift to be able to read directly from S3. So if, you're writing, if your application writes to S3, you can read from it with no latency, which is great. So um, it also has a sharing model, which means that, that, that whoever has access to a particular directory, it's like a sharing directory, um, two different people can share that directory, and that's great too, so, that, so you can have somebody who's a writer and somebody else who's a reader, and you've got a, you've got a great sharing model, and presto, it's just there, you don't have to move it. Um, um, so uh, um, Redshift with Spectrum can read from this, and Amazon Athena can read from this, and, um, and, and Amazon itself is starting to publish its data that it delivers to you into S3 directly. So AWS billing um, data is now available in S3, and we've got blocks for that. But, 
but it's always up to date, and, you, and, and the latency, there's no latency associated with it, so that's, that's really cool. Snowflake um, has always been born out of S3, so it's always read data from S3. This is how it's built. Um, and what, they, what they're really interesting about Snowflake is that you can spin up multiple data warehouses against the same data, and that you can also share data with other people, um, that same data that you can share. So they, they built a, a great sharing model within their, within their world. Um, and so that data can always be up to date and not have to move. Um, the Google Cloud Platform, um, BigQuery is kind of interesting. It's one of those things that there's like, the, I don't know, there's the, I've heard people refer to Google as the Google, right? It's, there's one instance of it, so it should have the, the before it. Well, and the BigQuery is the BigQuery. There's only one of them, right? And, you, and, you, and, and um, the data in it is all URL addressable. Um, so there's a, there's a one namespace for all the tables, and the data is, and, and there's a sharing model between the data and, and BigQuery so that you can actually just share data. And BigQuery is also building stuff so that you can read from Google Storage or Bigtable or, 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 or Google Sheets. So lots of different places that you can get data from, you, a great sharing model, and no, late, and no latency, and it's just there. Um, they're also building, uh, they're also starting to put their data directly into the database for you, so you can get your uh, AdWords data, AdWords 360, which of course we have a block for, and, and that's available also. Um, when data is fresh and accessible, like this, how do we think about it differently? How should we? What, what should we do differently? And how would and and how would Looker think about this differently? Right? What 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 should we be building for you to make that better and to take advantage of this? Um, and so what I'm going to show you. Um, the stuff, so we're going to talk about our bets, and what our bets were, were everything that I'm going to show you we could do before, but it was harder, and now it's easy. So Looker 4 was, made it possible. This was all possible. Looker 5 makes this stuff a lot easier. Um, and here are the bets. So uh, who's seen it? Who, who, who knows what a derived table is, a LookML derived table? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so uh, in, in LookML, a derived table is essentially a materialized view. It's a it's a it's a transformation that gets written back to the database. And in four, in Looker four, you had to write um, that transformation in SQL. And in Looker five, you can you can natively write that transformation in LookML. In LookML, every in Looker, every every query is representable in five parameters. So if you built a LookML dashboard, you would know this. But it's uh, the model. Um, the explorer, the basic, basically the table you're starting from, the fields, the filter, and the sort represents the query, and that's how you express a native derived table. So, um, so the derived tables in LookML are much easier. They can be persisted. They, you have all the kinds of things about linking them together. And if you haven't looked at the discourse articles on them, it's pretty amazing. Um, they're available in labs in 4.22, and they're, they're going to be full-fledged in Looker 5. Um, project imports is the other piece. I'm gonna, these, all these pieces are going to come together into something interesting, so but just let me describe the pieces first. Um, project imports is, the way, uh, is a way of actually including views, explorers, et cetera, from one project into another. And what that allows you to do is have a Git repo for one, w with one thing, say it's your core model, and then you ha you've got a, uh, a core game, and then, and then all of the games have different Import, import the core model and then make variations on it and fill stuff out. Or you've got a core Salesforce model and you make some variations on it. Um, this allows you to, to separate control, access control and developer control from, um, um, and it also allows you to create things like, uh, that are in, in other languages that are like modules or gems. And it's pretty exciting. We're really excited about it. And uh, Harthy showed this yesterday, but we've expanded the blocks directory to include data. Um, so, uh, uh, one of the really cool things that we built, I worked on with Daniel and Harthy, was the American Community Survey data, which is um, a half a terabyte of data with a thousand questions that goes against, um, uh, it's a thousand questions uh, down to the neighborhood block, to the sub neighborhood level, like, like, like basically the street level, a thousand questions so that you can get all kinds of demographic information like tremendous amounts of demographic information. And it's a super complicated model with lots of, lots of LookML-based derived tables. Um, and, um, but it's hard to under, you would, if, you, if you got this data in, you wouldn't, you'd, you'd lose your mind trying to figure out how to get the data out of it. But because we've got a model associated with it, it you can explore it. You don't have to really understand what's underneath it to get the value out of it. And I'll, I'll bring this all together in a second. So let me paint you a picture. Why do you, why do you care about all these things? Um, actually, hold on. Sorry. Let me paint you a picture. So, uh, <laughs> um, let's see. So, so say we have. Uh, uh, let's just take the demographic model for a second. Um, 
I've got, I'm, an, I'm an e-commerce company. I've got the demographic data. Um, I, got, I've got, I can explore this, this demographic model. And I, I, in my, in my, in my um, e-commerce model, the users all have zip code. That's the level of data that I have about them. I only have the zip code. I can go into the demographic model, import, and install it on my machine, put the block on the machine. Now I can explore this. Um, I go into it, and I click zip code and median income. Terrific. Now I have, by zip code, every median, the median income of everybody in, in, uh, in, in the US. I, I didn't have to know the schema or anything about how this data was organized. I can go in and get the lookML for that. So the lookML for that is a derived table that basically says start at the, at the, uh, the Geo Explorer, group by uh, zip code and, median in, and, and measure median income. Boom, I have a table that's just two columns wide. And I have some look, uh, lookML derived table for that. Using, cross project, uh, using project includes, I can go back to my e-commerce model, make that a derived table, join it in based on zip code, and then add a measure to measure users' median income, and now I can look at all my data by median income. So it was possible before, but it's easy now. OK, let me give you another example. I've got AWS billing data. Um, I've got, take the AWS billing data, I've got my Salesforce ID. I, I want to figure out my cost of goods sold for Looker, of what it costs to host each of you, right? So I group by Salesforce ID, uh, which is one of the custom fields that I've got, uh, me, uh, um, month and the amount of spend that I spent in AWS. And I can include that in my finance model, joining it on Salesforce ID. And now I know what the net revenue is for each for, for the cost of goods sold, and I don't have to understand how that model is implemented. Looker will go out and execute that derived table. It's not, it's not creating a persistent derived table. It'll actually go out and run that derived table, join it back in and, and into my model and have my results. So it, it, it's pretty remarkable that you, you've got the separation of these ideas. Sharing becomes using uh, derived tables to share data between projects, and Project Imports lets us control the um, the source control of those things separately. Okay, so pretty, pretty exciting, right? So the future is a world where there's no latency and no movement. It's gonna, we're, you're going to see some movement. We're, 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 there, there's movement, but slowly, slowly data is going to stop moving and being less latent. And when that happens, you can act on it. So the Cassini thing that was coming in that we couldn't steer, if there's no latency, I can steer it. I can drive from it. Right now, with your transactional, you steer from your transactional database because that's where that's where the the um, that's where there's low latency. So you build your apps there today. Like if you're building an app in Looker, you would build it from your transactional database if you wanted to act on it, like and make sure that it was up to date. But over time, as the latency drops, you're able to build it against your analytical database and take action directly from the analytical database, and that's pretty phenomenal. That's different in the world. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the things that we're working on are about making it so that you can centralize all this data, make it reusable, modular, relatable, so that you can actually um, uh, use it all together and get, and, and get value out of all of the different parts and other, parts, other data that's in the world that will work with your model. So, um, so that's what I see as the future. Thank you.